Philippians chapter 1 verse 20 is where we're at this morning. As Paul seeks to encourage the believers, I think the, of course, uh, context, Paul's in prison about ready to die for being faithful to the word of God. He's hopeful. He's going to talk to Nero. And hopefully he'll be able to correct some of the problems that have been caused by the accusation of the Jews that the Christians are a threat to the Roman Empire. And they are secretly and covertly trying to overthrow the lordship of the emperor. And of course, none of that's true. And so in Philippians 1.20, Paul says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Right, that's an important phrase. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also shall be shall Christ, shall Christ so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. And uh, I think Paul is again, as I said last week, I think he's taking into consideration his testimony here, and we should never be so confident in the flesh that. At any moment, we might fail. Because at any moment, we might fail. I uh, I can stand here boldly and say, if I had to die for Christ, I'd die for Christ. But uh, I also know at heart I'm a coward and uh, uh, all those other things. But I would determine to die for Christ under the same circumstances. And uh, I try to go forward into that situation with courage and wanting to maintain my testimony for Christ going out, um, you know, at least proclaiming Christ to, to those who are going to execute me. And that is, of course, what many of the early Christians did. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll start here. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for the encouragement of the Apostle Paul. Thank you for his steadfastness and Willingness, Lord, to write these words in this very difficult time of trial for him and his life. And thank you that he was faithful. Help us to be the same. Help us to grasp these truths now and make decisions about them before they ever come to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we talked a little bit about these words, uh, um, earnest expectation. So I, I think these are words of a man expecting God to bless. And that's a great blessing. I mean, it's a great thought. Even in this circumstance, as dire as it is, Paul was expecting God to use it and bless it. So the phrase means to look forward with an uplifted head. That's what earnest expectation means, to look with an uplifted head. What does that mean? He's looking up, expecting God to do something. So it's a sad situation when Christians ask God to do something and then do not look forward with their heads lifted, watching with grand expectation to see what God's going to do. It's an exciting time, right? Every trial becomes an exciting time. What's God going to do in this? You know, we, we face difficulties for us, but we believe in a God who is much greater than we are, and much larger than the circumstances in which we live. And should God choose to intervene in that, some wonderful things could happen. A magnificent thing, some marvelous things. So do not expect God to teach you without deeply convicting you. Do not expect God to teach you without deeply convicting you. Christian growth pains are real. Uh, I remember as a young boy, uh, one summer when I was in the sixth grade, I jumped up six inches in the summer. I grew six inches. Now that sounds like, well, yeah, I was over six feet tall when I went into the sixth grade. And uh, it sounds like it was, but every joint in my body hurt. And, uh, you know, my size, I, I, I wasn't, my, my other joints hadn't caught up. And, and I have problems with it today because I had that one great big growth spurt. I still have problems with my knees and my hips and all that because of that. Uh, the rest of my body didn't grow in proportion to that, uh, develop proportionately. I know a basketball player is seven foot four, 
And uh, he had that problem. He had a problem with his knees all of his life. In fact, most of the big guys in basketball, uh, the reason why they have to quit is because they just don't have the knees for it. Uh, the knees will go out because because they grow so quickly. So it's a sad situation when when all of this happens. But uh, every every part of the Christian growth is both painful and joyful. There's lots of joys in it, but yet there's lots of pains in it. That's mainly because most of us, like you, like me, <laughs> we learn mostly from our mistakes, our failures. What's unfortunate is to make a mistake and not learn by it and keep repeating the same thing over good over again. So God's doing the work through the difficult situation, the trials of our faith to change us from within. He was doing that with Paul. Even in this time, he was strengthening Paul. What was he strengthening? His faith. To be able to believe God for the best in the, most worst, in the worst circumstance. So this kind of change is often heart-wrenching. It's fearful. Certainly tearful. And James addresses this aspect of, of the Christian growth in his epistle. If you want to go over there, James chapter 1. And he talks about, he's talking here about Christian growth. And uh, he, he uses this word perfect in this text. And we'll see it a number of times. It's from the Greek word teleos. And it means complete. Wanting nothing. So in most cases, it's referring to spiritual maturity. But the idea is to grow in such a way that in any difficult circumstances, no matter how difficult it is, your faith will be able to trust God for it and look for good things out of it. It is uh, some of the greatest difficulty. I, I remember my being in the hospital with my open heart surgery. I'd be there quite a while. But I had, it was almost like a ministry center in there. <laughs> I had uh, cleaning ladies coming in and they'd say, you're a pastor, aren't you? We've heard about you and because and, I'm witnessing to people. And, and they'd stand there and talk to me until one of the supervisors came in looking for them. And, and uh, we'd have uh, good conversations about the Lord. And, and uh, it was a, probably did as much ministry there as I do outside uh, before when I'm well. But... Uh, through circumstances, we just have to watch and wait for God to do things. And uh, sometimes we think those circumstances to be, be bad, and God's using them for good. And that's what James is addressing here in this, in this time. The church at this time was a difficult situation. James was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, and they were under a great persecution from the Jews. A lot of them have been killed. They'd lost their businesses, and uh, there was a, a covert campaign against Christians in, in Rome, and, or in uh, Jerusalem, and there was a lots of Christians at Jerusalem, big church, and uniquely, they, because they were Jews, they were meeting in the temple. James was actually killed in the Jewish temple and cast down from the temple, thrown over the top of the, the wall, cast down and killed by that method. Um, so I, I find a lot of that amazing. So here, in that kind of situation, here we read the words of James. Context. Historical context. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, various temptations. Now, what that word temptation there means, it means putting to the proof. Putting to proof. You fall, you fall into various kinds of things in your life where God puts you to the proof. And it's referring to the difficulties of the circumstances of living faithful to God in a world at enmity with God. So in those diverse temptations, what? It counted all joy. That's the that's same, thing, same thing Paul is saying in, in Philippians 1.20. Earnest expectation. Same kind of thing. Now look at verse 3. Knowing this. Do you know this? Here, here's what you should know. Through all kinds of difficulties. All, diff all, all kinds of trials. That the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now that word patience is, is a Greek word that means hopeful endurance. 
You're hopeful in the difficult situations. While living with the difficulties of the circumstances of living faithful to God in the world and living with God. So you're hopeful. That's just work with patience. You stay under, you, you endure while living with the difficulties. And then it doesn't end there. But let patience, that hopeful endurance, have her perfect work. Teleos again. <coughs> Maturing and completing. Bringing you to full Christian maturity. It is through the trying of your faith that these things happen. Uh, the Christian life is intended, intended to be easy. That's the nonsense of this health and wealth theology that is propagated today. It's, that's totally contrary to the word of God. Jesus didn't say things would all get really rosy and wonderful. He said, I'm going to get tough for you. You'll be a Christian in this world, going to be tough. So, but let, ha let patience have her perfect, her maturing, her completing work. That you may be perfect and entire, what? Wanting nothing. Spiritual wholeness or spiritual integrity. Fully prepared for any circumstance life brings to our doorstep. And so you, at the purpose of trials, it is to test you. I remember when we were, years ago, we used to get a new car. We, we've had a couple of new cars. We don't buy them that way anymore. But uh, uh, we bought a couple of new cars. And the first thing they said now, we had a new engine put in our pickup here last year, two years ago. I don't remember what it was. And he said, now, don't drive it over 35 um, for the first 3,000 miles. What he meant was 3,500 RPMs. I said, 35? He said, 3,500 RPMs. And I said, okay. I very seldom ever would ever get it up to 3,500 RPMs anyway. But uh, the point is you got to break something in. Uh, and that is the same thing God is talking about here. Uh, why? That you may be perfect, mature, equipped. And it's, I'm not talking about sinless perfection here talking about Christian maturity, so that when difficulties come along, you're ready for them, you're, you're prepared for them. And not just can endure them, but you can be hopeful in them, that God's going to do something good out of it. And sometimes it's just other people watching you. So wanting nothing, that's spiritual integrity. Fully prepared for any circumstance life brings to our doorstep. Now, look at verse 5. If any, if any of you lack wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the heart and mind of God operating in our lives. We know both the heart and the mind of God, what his will is, and then that is living in our life. That's what wisdom is. If any of you lack that, it says, let him ask of God. When it comes to those difficult situations, those trials, various trials and temptations, when those come, ask God for wisdom, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And I get into a situation of life, I say, Lord, I don't know what to do here. And the Lord will tell me. He's going to give me something in the scriptures. He's not going to come out and say to me now, uh, do this and do this and do this. He's going. To, I'm going to read his Read, read his word. And when those kind of situations come, I spend time in the Psalms and in the Proverbs. Those are the wisdom books. So I want to I want to ask God what to do. I read Psalms and Proverbs, and God will give me an answer in the Psalms and Proverbs. So let him ask in faith. What does that mean? What is it asking in faith? Looking, watching, and expecting God to do something. So when I ask in faith, when I ask God for wisdom... I am looking, watching, and expecting God to do something. And then he says, nothing wavering. That means never doubting that God will act. God is alive and well. And when I ask him uh, to do something, uh, when I ask for him to show, God will act. Now look at this. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Otherwise, it has no means to control itself. It's uncontrolled. The waves have no control. When the wind comes, they are, they are just driven by the wind. 
But you don't want to be that way. You don't want to be like that. You want to be under control, the control of God. And then for the man that wavereth, he says in verse 7, For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because you're out of control. And then he uses that. He says a double-minded man. He who doubts but says he believes is unstable in all these ways. So when I pray for God, pray to God in a difficult circumstance, I must live in faith expecting God to do something that will magnify himself. Not necessarily fix my problem or take me out of that problem, but that through that difficulty, God will magnify himself and use the circumstance to his glory. And I can look with expectation of that. If it ends in my life, as it, Paul says in uh, Philippians 1, 1.20, if it ends in my wife, life, so be it. The important thing is God gets glorified in this world, magnified, and then I get to go to heaven. So that's not a bad thing. So that word perfect there means God wants us to know ourselves so completely, to understand our weaknesses and faults so thoroughly that he can work with us to correct them. It's not that we correct them by ourselves. God wants to partner with us, that's fellowship with God, in correcting those things. Now it's a painful experience to look into God's spiritual mirror, that's the perfect law of liberty in James 1, 22-25, and see ourselves the way God sees us. What the word of God exposes about us and in us must be confronted by our own wills through the supernatural enabling of the indwelling Christ. It's not just that we look at it and see what God says it sees about us and walk away and leave it alone. Don't say, well, I can't change myself. No, nobody can change. Well, we can change. And we work with God and we ask God to help us. So in doing so, you become then a partner with God in the process of spiritual transfiguration from within Romans 12, 1, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Those are the conditions. And be not conformed to this world, uh, don't let the world shape you. That's what the word conform means there, to put into a mold. But be ye transformed. That's a present passive imperative. <laughs> present tense means be ye being. Passive means you're not doing it. God's transforming you. Trans the metamorphio is actually the same word trans translated transfigured in another place. So be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is uh, the Word of God does that renewing in our lives, and uh, literally we're being changed from within. Uh, it's a preaching of the Word that does that. It is a teaching of the Word that does that. It is your devotional reading of the Word of God. All of that is doing that transformation. You're transfigured by the renewing of the Word of God, washing of the water of the Word. So the process uh, never ends in this life. Until I am dead, resurrected, glorified, whatever the case might be. Uh, now, of course, when I go to heaven, I'm going to leave the old body and I die. I'm, the old body is going to stay behind in the grave. And I won't have a sin nature in heaven then. But when I'm glorified and get a new body, the redemption of the body, I'm going to get a body without a sin nature. And every want of that body is going to be to glorify God. I'm looking forward to that. So in this life, this process never ends of transfiguring. God is always working his perfecting work in us, constantly refining us. And with each refining, making us pure and pure uh, in our walk with him. However, every prayer is a primary trial of our faith as we pray and watch, expecting God to do something. Now, I could spend the rest of the morning, probably most of the day today, giving you examples of this in our lives, in the many years we've been Christians now, where God has, where we just,
pray and watch God, expecting God to do something, and then watch what God does. And it's been an exciting journey, hasn't it, Patty? It's been an exciting journey. We've watched it with our children, with our grandchildren, and we are still watching. We have some grandchildren that are not saved, and some of them, I, we believe God's going to do work in all of their lives. And we're watching and waiting. We're watching and waiting for people we've witnessed to for years, for them to open their hearts. Whatever it takes in our lives, we're watching and waiting for God to do that. Um, maybe you have something. You have something that's right on your lips right now that you'd like to share about that? Anybody? Either you don't want to share it or God never done anything in your life. <laughs> well, maybe think about it a little bit. See, that is what the quest for spiritual integrity is addressed in here in the epistle of James and what it's all about. And spiritual integrity is spiritual completion or maturity. Now, I've been saved for 50 years and I don't think I'm still mature. <laughs> I'm still... I've, there's a lot of areas in my life that need more work, and I'm glad God's still working on it. I love, what is that song, God's Still Working on Me? I like that song. And, uh, um, that is the purpose of God, uh, giving gifted men to teach believers in local churches, to perfect them, equip them, mature them for the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4.12. And therefore, a central purpose of the epistle of James is to understand what God is doing in our lives so that we can cooperate with him rather than struggle with him. I encourage you to get a copy of the book In Search of Spiritual Integrity. There's some on in the back table there and read it devotionally. Um, and I'll read a chapter a week and, and uh, I think it will be a blessing to you. It certainly was to me when I wrote it and I think it will be a blessing to you if you read it. So therefore, a central purpose of the epistle to James, of, of James, is to understand what God is doing in our lives so that we can cooperate with him rather than struggle against him. And it always bothers me to hear Christians complaining because they've got some difficulties in their lives. Difficulties is part of our growth process. I, I've written a paraphrase here of James 1, 2 through 4. And here's a paraphrase of it. My brethren, fellow believers, consider all trials necessary for the potential joy of spiritual integrity, complete maturity. When you daily happen upon various kinds of trials and difficulties, knowing that God is testing your belief system to prove your endurance. So let God work with you so that you can have spiritual integrity. Isn't that what we want? So we can welcome trials. We don't get upset with God about trials. We welcome them. James wants us to know about the forces that work against us from without, trials and temptations, and within, sinful and selfish desires of the flesh. And all of those are going on. Now, I had a question last week about this, the word salvation in uh, Philippians 1.20. And we often take words like salvation and we make them always mean the same thing. But there is a, uh, when you do that, it's a, there's a word for that. It's called monotheism. Can you all say that? Mono means one, theism, one word. So you have one meaning or one, one, one meaning of one word. But monotheism is giving one de definition to a word even when the context in which it is used might demand a variation of meaning. So not always when the word salvation is used in the text is it talking about the beginning of our salvation. It can be talking about the salvation of our life. It can be talking about the salvation of our body. That's the end of our salvation. An example of this, of course, is the word salvation in Philippians 1.19 where the text says, For I know that thou this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. In the context, then in verse 20, along with an inductive hermeneutic, would include that Paul is talking about the salvation of his soul, for that salvation, he, he's not talking about that. 
uh, because that salvation was secured the moment he was born again, the Spirit of Christ. And there's no doubt about salvation. If you've trusted in Christ, uh, Colossians chapter 2, you're complete. Complete is a perfect tense. Once for all, forever, you, you've been crucified with Christ, you're buried with Christ, you're risen with Christ, you're seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father already. And that is a perfect tense in that text. So he, he's not talking about the salvation of his soul. The context of Philippians 1, 19 through 20 could be understood, could be understood that Paul, to mean that Paul is talking about the redemption of his body through the resurrection and glorification. These are could be. However, even if Paul were to be martyred for Christ at this time, his re resurrection and redemption of his body would not happen until the second phase of the first resurrection at the rapture of the church. So, uh, I think he's talking about something that's going to happen right away. Now, present Christians understood, understand more about the seven-year tribulation than do the believers at the time of the writing of the uh, epistle of the Philippians most, prob Philippians, most probably written about A.D. 64. When was the book of Revelation written? Anybody remember? Got a got it in your Bibles? 95 or 96? Right in there. So many years later, 30 some 30, probably at least 32 years later. So they didn't even have the book of Revelation yet. So Christians understood that the second coming of Christ was first in the air for the church, age believers, because they already had the first epistle of First Thessalonians, and that was written in 54 AD, which is the first epistle. That was the first of Paul's epistle. So that's written 12, or 10, 10 years earlier than the Philippian epistle. So they knew that Christ was coming in the air for them, before they knew a great deal about the seven-year tribulation, except for the Old Testament, what that teaches. They also believed that Christ's second coming was imminent at any moment. So they were thinking that Christ could come at any moment for them. So the only reason it may be possible that Paul is speaking of the salvation of his testimony is what he says in Philippians 1.20, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Do we actually pray for our testimony? Do we pray that our life will not be lived in contradiction to the things of Jesus Christ, so that we would not blaspheme his name, or live in a manner to bring disrespect upon the name of Christ? we pray for that? I think that's what Paul is praying here. He's saying, if I've got to go out, let me go out uh, being a, having a faithful testimony. When a believer's witness to those that follow him is corrupted by compromise just to save his temporal life, the next generation will be weakened and follow the model, the bad model. So make sure we set the good example. I want my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and everyone that ever has any knowledge of me in this world to know that what I believe is important and, and uh, that I'm willing to die for those beliefs. And I hope I can go out without a whimper. I can go out with a smile on my face and rejoicing that God would allow that to happen. By whatever means it happens. You know, if I die a natural death or die from some sickness or die at the hands of another uh, persecutor, whatever the case might be, that I can go out being faithful. I could hear the words of Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant, to be faithful unto the end. So when a believer's witness to those that follow him is compromised, we weaken the model. When persecution comes, those of weak faith and living under the sun will compromise. If you're not praying about a good testimony and maintaining a strong testimony, if that's not at the forefront of your mind, you'll be thinking how to make things easier for you. And how to escape the difficult things. Uh, if persecution comes in the, into our country, I don't want to be hiding someplace in the woods. No, I want to protect as, uh, the church and keep them safe. 
But at the same time, uh, when we sing, are we going to sing in whispers if we have to meet in the woods? If they called us up here, we have to meet in the woods someplace uh, or out in the open. Are we going to sing our songs in whispers? Or we sing with the boldness of Christ. You see, we can't be those kind of people who are willing to compromise. This cannot be the way a leader leads. Now, I just have, I want to go over to Psalm, or 2 Corinthians 11 here. By, by the words of Philippians 1.20, it is apparent that Paul is concerned about being faithful unto death if necessary. That, is, that, that he can go out of this world being faithful. Words communicating, communicating willingness are not the same as teaching the potential pains of, what, of that willingness. A lot of brave words come from men who have never tasted blood in their mouths. Words mingled with one own blood in one own mouth would be the ultimate test and testimony to real faith and eternal promises of Christ. Paul tasted blood in his mouth many times. He had his back shredded with cat of nine tails. He's beaten with canes or with, with uh, rods many times. This is the meaning of the words that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness is always. <clears throat> so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. When a man tasted his own blood in his own mouth, as often as Paul did, there's always a tendency to want, uh, want to avoid the next round. <laughs> If you've ever been there, you, you know what I'm talking about. I have played football games with broken bones and broken fingers. Uh, I had my nose broken 13 different times. Nowadays, if you bleed, you can't play anymore. Um, in those days when I was playing, you were usually bleeding by the end of the first few minutes someplace on your body, and you played all the game. I played most of my high school football career with cotton stuffed up my nose to keep me from bleeding to death and then you can't bleed, bleed, believe, uh, breathe anymore and uh, I had one one kid that broke his arm right here in one game both bones in his arm he carried the arm off the field like this and it's hanging straight down and two weeks later he's got a cast on it and he's back playing again nowadays he'd be out for three years you know but uh, um, not that I think that you ought to go play that way, you know, it's kind of silly, really, it's just a game, but uh, I guess that's how they made men out of us. But, <laughs> I, I don't know. Here's what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. Here's, here's this remarkable guy. Here's what he's already been through. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. <clears throat> that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolish, foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Because what he's going to boast about is the trials that he suffered. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. And of course, many of these people say, well, Paul, you're a fool to go through all of these persecutions for what you've done. Why didn't you just soften up your message? He says, for, verse 20, For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take, take of you, steal from you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolish. First, he's going to brag a little bit, if you will. At least that's how it's going to be perceived, that he, was, he went through a lot of persecution. He says, I am bold also. Paul consistently was bold regardless of the persecution he received. He says, are they Hebrews? Of course, he was being persecuted by the Jews. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. 
Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Because, of course, the priesthood was doing the priesthood of Israel was doing the persecution. I am more. In labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and death off. I believe Paul was killed at least once, maybe twice, and God brought him back to death. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. You know why they, they only give you 39? Because they think they figured 40 would kill you. So they stopped on the 39th one so they didn't kill you. That doesn't mean a lot of those people that got 40 stripes uh, weren't killed. And it depends on what they gave you the stripes with. Uh, sometimes it was a cat of nine tails with pieces of bone and rock and glass tied into the strips of the tongs so that when they hit you with them, they would embed in the flesh and then they'd rip them out. And by it was done, the back was like hamburger, and that's what it was with Christ. <clears throat> he said, thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And of course, when they stoned you, they stoned you to death. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, otherwise in the ocean, in the sea. In journeyings often, perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by my own countrymen, the Jews, and perils by the heathen, that's, that's the Gentiles, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. Otherwise, wherever Paul went, there was somebody there wanting to kill him. Verse 27, in weariness and painfulness and watching often, in hunger and thirst and fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Now, how many of you would want to be an apostle? <laughs> because this is the way almost all of them lived and died. Paul, because he was a missionary, going into every city, he was at the front of the lines and taking the stones and everything else right there in the front. And then he says, besides those things that are without, all the persecutions, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Was, was Paul some kind of super saint? No, he's a man of flesh and bone, just like you and I. Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I have a glory of the things which concern what? My weaknesses, my infirmities. Because God was made strong in my weaknesses. Magnified. And God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is blessed forever more. Knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Eretus, the king, kept the city of Dam Damascus with a garrison, desires to apprehend me, and through a basket, through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Otherwise, he'd have died again. But the point is, God was magnified. Because even though Paul was killed, God brought him back to life again. He didn't resurrect him and glorify him, but he brought him back to life. There was like those that at the death of Christ, many were in the graves, were, the graves were open. Many came back to life and walked the streets, witness to their families. And, uh, and uh, then, of course, died again, waiting the resurrection and redemption of the body. So after all the persecutions and sufferings Paul experienced, why was he now concerned about doing something for which he might be ashamed? He'd borne up on every other one. He, he'd been faithful. Because every person knows his testimony will be carried forward from the success of his last battle. That's why prize fighters go out as winners. They don't, they don't want to try to fight another fight where they're going to lose. They want to retire when they're winners. And every, every man knows he gets old and he's frail and he becomes weak. Men and women who have been faithful for most of their lives are often remembered by one failure that brought them down. The last, the last failure. Now we have to know that testimonies are fragile. They're fragile. A lifetime of integrity can be dissolved in a moment of weakness. I, I know it's true. 
It takes a lifetime to build trust and a few seconds to lose it. Testimonies are fragile. Faithful people concern themselves with such things. They think about it. They are not concerned because they want to protect their reputations, but so as not to scar the body of Christ with moments of thoughtlessness and careless choices of compromise. It's always been a heartbreaker for me to watch old pastors begin to compromise. Their children grow up and they don't begin to, they don't live the, for the Lord the way their dad did. And now their dad begins to compromise his position because their kids have compromised theirs. And dad wants to be accepted by his kids. I've seen it happen so many times. Unfortunately, that's not the way to go. I know some of these very large, famous preachers are getting in their old years of life and they have a son now is coming up and he's going new evangelical and emergent. And they want to keep him in the ministry because they think it's something to hand down to the next generation. Not the way it works. Eli made that mistake. Samuel made that mistake. And even though they were faithful most of their life, they went out in disgrace, unfortunately. Paul's earnest expectation was that Christ would be magnified and glorified through the circumstances in which he once again found himself. Even in this, one more time, maybe this would be the last time. It didn't happen to be at Philippi, at the writing of this letter to Philippi. It would be a number of years later. But he would die eventually for Christ. But verse 19, the, la the, the second part of that verse in Philippians 1. Paul expected Christ to supply grace enabling for his trial. Because faithful, spirit-filled people prayed for that supply. People were praying for Paul. And he expected God to provide him the strength to endure through another difficult trial. So the Greek text intimately joins the two nouns together. Um, this is a quote from Jameson Fawcett in Com Brown Commentary. The Greek text intimately joins the two nouns together by having but one preposition and one article. Through your prayer and the consequent supply of the Spirit of Christ obtained for me through your prayer. is what the text means. Otherwise, you have, obtained, you have obtained from Christ the strength that I need. Isn't that a wonderful text? Someone else praying obtained for Paul the strength that Paul needed. And it was an encouragement to him to know that through that supply of the Spirit of Christ, Obtained through their prayer, Paul could go into that battle knowing for sure. The point here is that the supply to Paul is a consequence of a spirit-filled prayer from Philippian believers. Their prayer created a spiritual synergism, a partnership of enabling, even though miles separated Paul from Philippians, from, from them. And I, fr from that text, I wrote a little plaque I used for many years on the door office of my door of the door of my office it said let your heart soar on the wings of prayer to places and people your hands may never reach we can send a missionary over we can send some money over for your support but we need to we need to back that up with prayer we need to send our uh, petitions to God first and God will get those petitions to to the missionary. Now, your pastor is just as much in need of those as anyone else, and, and that, that must be what we do. So, prayer can touch hearts when your hands cannot. Prayer can move people. Understand this, when people get upset with you about what you're saying, prayer can give understanding and open ears when you are nowhere nearby. Pray for people. Ask God to intervene. Ask God to magnify himself. Prayer can break down barriers and doors. They can slam a door in your face. 
but they can't slam a door in God's face. I said, he can just go right through. Prayer understands that God is not restrained by human barriers and locked doors. There is nowhere on planet Earth where the touch of, a, of God cannot can be restrained. Remember that. It'll change your prayer life. And when somebody is the most upset about some of the things that you have said, remember this. That's when God's working the hardest. God has put them under conviction. They're upset about what they believe is contrary to what you have told them, and they get upset about it. Welcome it. God's working. Understand it. Now, I don't know if i got time to do this this morning. I think we'll stop here. Because I want to read Psalm 139. Read it this week, will you? Spend some time in 139. We'll go through it next Sunday. Because it gives us information about God and His infinite knowledge, uh, infinite knowledge of every soul. We, we know God's omnipresence and His omniscience, all of these things. We know of these, His om, omnipotence. But we, we, we kind of restrict Him to anthropomorphic ideas. And we think in the lines of what God is restricted like we are, and he's not. And Psalm 139 deals with the omnipotence, the omniscience, and the omnipresence of God. And his knowledge. What God knows. And, and it's a wonderful psalm. We'll look at that next week. Any questions or comments this morning? I'm just standing here and wait for five minutes. <laughs> you Fred? I had a dirt board yesterday for trying to share the word. And it was hard. Yeah. Did you praise God for it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you come out of those things, even though it's hard, you praise God for it. Then you expect him to. She lost it. Yeah. It was a struggle for me to. I want to keep yeah, keep your perspective of what God's doing in it. If they're upset, it's because they're upset with the Word of God, not with you. You're just a messenger boy. I always tell people, I say, they get really upset with me. I say, well, I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just telling you the Word of God. And you have to have that conversation with God. It's right here. Open up your Bible. It's right here. Everything I just said to you is right here. You get upset with God. I'm just, I'm just a messenger boy. But I praise God that you hang in there, buddy. That's what we got to do. That's uh, that verse of scripture talks about breaking up the fallow ground. And, uh, you know, we just have to keep doing it. Keep breaking up the fallow ground. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for our time together in Sunday school here. And this text in Philippians 1, 19 through 20. It's a great reminder to us of of what we should be and how we should live. And I just pray for the next hour as well and use it in your name and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. I saw Karen go downstairs. She probably made some coffee.